Um, so I want to talk about property usage because I get a lot of calls about property usage again and again and we've had some interesting court rulings around property usage recently. And the first thing I want to talk is about is space usage. So congregations that are have other groups using your space. How many of you have other groups using your building space? All right, so a good number of you, right? Um, I want to start by reminding you that you should only get usage fees from other not-for-profits. All right, you should not be renting your space or getting a usage fee from your space for a for-profit group. All right. That's the first starting point. The ideal is not-for-profit. And that not-for-profit should be in keeping with your mission. So if you have an exercise group in your space, and I know a good number of congregations do, could that be in keeping with your mission? I don't know what your mission is, but of course it could be, depending on how you understand it. Is it outreach to the neighborhood? Is it, is it you want everybody to be healthy in body and spirit? It's, but you, you should be making sure that you understand a connection to your mission in what you're doing as, as you go about doing this. All right? um, the usage fee from the space, from what you're getting from this group, should be put back into the building in the same, to running the building, to keeping the upkeep of the building, et cetera. And you should be able to document that. All right? how that's happening. It should not just go right into your general operating budget with the idea that, well, yeah, we're probably spending that on electricity, or yeah, well, sometime we'll have to replace the floor because there are people walking on it. You should be able to document how it's going back into key, because what you're basically saying is we're charging these people what it costs to have them in the building. All right? That's what you're looking for. Right? Because you're not paying taxes on your property, right? because you're not making profits on your property. If you are making profits on your property, what should you be doing? Yeah. Paying taxes, all right? which is another alternate here. But, okay. but doing anything other than this means you're taking a huge chance with your tax status. Um, just as, for instance, renting out your manse without putting it back on the tax rolls does. All right. I'm aware of a good number of congregations that tell me they have to take these chances. And so you're not alone if you're sitting there saying, well, but we can't do that, we can't survive unless we do this. But you need to be aware of the consequences all right, if, you're, if you're doing this. Um, we've had a series of problems. The most recent was in New City, so in Rockland County this past fall. Um, in Rockland County this past fall, um, the, uh, uh, there was a church, a non-Presbyterian church in this case, that um, had tenants living in its manse after the pastor moved out. And um, it kept it off the tax rolls. Right? And because it's hard to get a piece of property back off the tax rolls once you put it on. All right? So it kept it off the tax rolls, and the, the new city found out about it. And they went after them. Not only did they want take away their tax exempt status for the time, and they're currently litigating that again, but they also had to pay fifteen thousand dollars in back taxes. All right. So it's a dangerous thing. More and more villages and towns and municipalities are having a hard time balancing their own roles, their own expenses, and they are looking more carefully at what is happening in individual religious organizations. And I had one congregation that called me that said, we've just found out our nursery school is not tax, it's not a not-for-profit. And what do we do? Right. That's a problem. But I said, so here's what the problems could be. And the answer was, well, but our village really likes us. So they would never do anything because we offer them space. And I'll tell you firsthand, that it's great that your village likes you. But when push comes to shove, often you still will find yourself in a precarious situation. So please, please pay attention. Some of these groups that are in your space don't know that they could be not-for-profits. And so if you really want to keep the relationship with them, you might say, hey, nursery school, become a not-for-profit. Or hey, um, yoga or exercise class or 
or whatever you have in there, become a not-for-profit and we will then be happy to keep you as long as we meet these other requirements. But please pay attention to that in this way. Right? Can you rent out a piece of property? All right. And here I'm talking about being a house you own or your parking lot or anything else. All right. Can you rent it out? Yes, you can. As long as you put it back on the tax rolls, that's number one, and you report the income from the rental each year. There are two steps. You can't just put it back on your tax rolls but never report the income. All right. You have to do two things. You put it back on, so yes, it's, it's worth it to our church to rent out our parking lot. Or it's worth it to our church to rent out this, this manse that we have that doesn't have a pastor in it right now. Put it on the tax rolls. Right. It's now taxable property. Now pay tax on what you get in on it. You're fine. But you have to make that shift. Most churches are not used to doing that. Right. So that's, that's um, an important starting point. Now, when you're doing things like renting out your property, property permissions along the way, if your congregation is going to acquire a piece of property, and I don't care if it's by purchase or by gift, but if you get a piece of property, or you're going to encumber a piece of property, this is whether you're going to take a mortgage on a piece of property, or you're going to give somebody an easement to your property, all right, or you're going to lease a piece of property for more than five years all right, to a group, so you, that house that you no longer need now for your, your clergy person, you're now going to give a five-year lease to somebody. Not only do you have to worry about putting it back on the rolls, you also now have to get the permission of presbytery while you do that. That means taking it to the presbytery's bill, uh, budget finance and property committee in order to get their permission to do this. All right, that's where it goes, to the budget finance and property committee before you do it. So I told the beginning clerk session training meeting that when your minutes show that you've agreed to do this as a session, one of the things that goes into the session minutes is, and when was this put before your uh, presbytery's BFP? All right. Otherwise, you should not be doing it. You haven't matched the requirements. Why is that important? Because one of the things that will happen, for instance, if um, you've got a piece of property and there's a question about it down the road, we get this most with cemeteries, but we get it with other things as well as, um, is the presbytery aware that this church has a cemetery? Yeah, we're aware of it. Are you aware that nobody has done anything on the roads for it for the last 25 years? Because now we're going to hold you responsible as the presbytery for doing something about it. And then we have to go in and, but we didn't know we suddenly had acquired that presbytery piece of property because nobody had told us. Right? We can't help make sure it's maintained if we don't know it's there. So it's a requirement. Plus, for good or for bad, and I know people feel differently about this, property of individual congregations is held in trust for the Presbyterian Church denominationally rather than for individual congregations, not owned by individual congregations. Yeah? If we have tenants, do we have to prove? Do they have to submit some kind of documentation that they are a nonprofit? If you have tenants using, the using your space, um, the, you would ask them to pr show, I, I would ask them to pl play it safe to show that they are not-for-profit. I mean, people assume that gr certain groups are not-for-profits, but as I've said, we've had gr churches call and say, we've just found out that so-and-so is not a not-for-profit, what do we do? So, um, and we've had now a series of different churches that have had this problem um, in, in Westchester and Rockland. It so far has not made it that I'm aware of to Duchess or Putnam or Sullivan or Orange, but it's becoming more and more common. So um, you all need to be aware that it's there. All right, so um, if you're gonna acquire property, I don't care if it's a gift, I don't care if it's a five inch piece of property, you need to run through these processes. If you're gonna sell a piece of property, if you're gonna take, oh, I only need, we need to borrow $3,000 on a piece of property. You still need to, to go through these steps, all right? So um, I realize that, that this is, for a lot of congregations, truly problematic. And I'm happy to talk with you individually about how to make it work um, for you. But it we, uh, we have a huge number of congregations that are in violation of these property rules in various ways. All right. 
Um, so uh, let's try to work together if, if we can. Organizations like the 4-H and Girl Scouts are considered not-for-profit. They would just need a statement on letterhead? Right? Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're clearly not-for-profit. Um, and most of those as well have their own insurance and that are under national umbrellas. And so you've got, you've got that usually all together. You should be asking, obviously, for groups using your space to have in, that they have insurance as well. And often on an organization like that, you'll get the whole thing together. It will say, we are insuring the Girl Scouts of America, not-for-profit corporation, blah, blah, blah. And if you have that on your insurance, you, you're good. All right. Now, if you're not charging them a fee to use the church. If you're not charging them, different issue. Different issue. We do allow people to give us a donation. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a different issue. It, well. <laughs> you, you just you, you said two different things. Yeah. Um, you allow them to give whatever they want? Yes, basically. Okay. So if, if it's like, uh, gee, if you want to come in and you, you, space is free, if you want to give us money, that's fine. If we, you give us nothing, that's fine. That's fine. If most congregations, knowing that you're not supposed to lease an, for a not-for-profit, say, well, we'll give you a usage fee instead. So we'll ask you to donate $50 every time you're here. Once you're into that, donate $50 every time you're here, you're really into the equivalent of leasing. And you're back to the make sure it's a not-for-profit that has a mission that you're using that money to keep the heat on in that building. So if you have separate buildings, for instance, um, where are folks from Germans? Okay, so you have one building across the way from your sanctuary, clearly divided by a road. I'll use you as an example. You can't have a group in your educational wing and say, yeah, and so we're putting that money back into the sanctuary because clearly they're not connected heat-wise or um, upkeep-wise or so forth. It has to be being put back into the area that you're actually using with that group. So if you want this to put heat on in your sanctuary, you better, to pay for heat in the sanctuary, you better make sure that group is using your sanctuary or something connected with that, that piping system, okay? is what we're talking about. Finally, I want to make you aware of a, um, a case that, that is making its way through the courts now that has to do with clergy housing allowance that will have a huge impact on every congregation, some more immediately, some later. Um, it is a case that was um, brought in Wisconsin. You may say, well, we're not in Wisconsin, so why do I care about this case? It was brought in the, the Western District Court in Wisconsin, um, and the judge in that district court uh, ruled that the section of the U.S. tax code that allows ministers to having a housing allowance um, that is tax exempt was illegal under the establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution. Right? Um, so what that means is until it's overturned that technically in Wisconsin, clergy who don't have a manse, who have a housing allowance, can't claim it as a housing allowance and not pay tax on it. So they will have to pay tax on it the same way they do on their regular salary, which means that they will be making less per year if they're doing that, considerably less in a lot of cases, which means it will be harder for them to continue to serve the congregations they're serving at the amount that they're currently being paid. It's at only Wisconsin. The case was appealed, however, to the Seventh Circuit, which is where it is now, all right? And we're now waiting to see what's gonna happen in the Seventh Circuit. I'm telling you this because technically, if the Seventh Circuit upholds this case, all right, that only affects, gee, that affects Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin. We're still not in that area, and so, the IRS will go after Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin. Big deal, all right? But the IRS likes to, has the discretion to have treat all states the same way. They don't like to have one rule in one area and other rules in another area. And so if they're told you have to do this in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin, odds are good what they're gonna say is we are eliminating the clergy housing allowance tax exemption. So this is coming up. You may say, oh, but we have a manse. We're safe. 
All right. The group that has brought this action, this has been tried several places, and the first time we, we got in the ruling this way, its goal is to take away manses as well. So they've already said publicly that once they get the housing allowance removed, they will then try to take away manses. It will have to, well, it depends on whether the Supreme Court will take the case or not. We don't know. I mean, if the Seventh Circuit upholds this, the Supreme Court may decide they're not going to accept it. So we don't know. Uh, but you need to be aware because it makes all of our congregations very precarious unless you have huge, huge, huge amounts of extra money to pay your clergy sitting there. It's a very precarious situation for all of us. So you should be watching this court case. All right, along the way. Now you also need to know, you may say, well, what's the denomination doing about this? Back in the 1980s, the Presbyterian Church came out with a ruling that said that they really didn't see a reason that there should be a non-tax tax exemption for housing allowances. So they are actually technically on the side of the, if we were pushed, on the side of this the people bringing this case. So. It's not the best situation for clergy at the moment um, that this is going on, all right? Uh, and the reason is, if you, if you need to understand why the denomination said this, when manses were put in in this country, the idea was there weren't hotels to stay at and there weren't other places to stay. And so if somebody came into a town and needed a place to stay and they were looking around, people said, oh, go to the minister's home, they'll take you in, right? And yet now, Generally, if um, I don't, I, I have a housing allowance, for instance, I'll use myself. And I don't expect that anybody who happens to get it to Dobbs Ferry and doesn't have a place to stay before they check a hotel will come to my house and say, gee, you know, put me up and feed me. Right? We, we have a different understanding today of both manses and housing allowances. And so that's part of the reason that you're beginning to see the arguments made the other way with some validity of how things have, have shifted. All right. So it's, you need to be aware of, of the, the, the case happening all right? and to pay attention to it because odds are good we will have a Seventh Circuit ruling before we meet again together next year. Um, so just so you're aware of it. Questions on any of that? What did you mean by uh, that this action could possibly affect Mances as well? In what way? The, 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 group, it has, the group that has brought this action has said that once they get a ruling that eliminates housing allowance, they are next going to go after manses. And so if this goes through, what we'll then see is a case brought, I imagine, back in the Wisconsin court again, for um, bringing up uh, manses as being um, illegal under the Establishment Clause as well. So the mans itself would be illegal, or that the pastor would so be illegal? The, the, the housing, the tax on it, not paying the tax on it. And that would, be, that would be even harder for congregations because it would do two things. The pastor would be paying tax on the amount that their housing allowance is worth, the 30% or the market value, whichever is higher, right? And at the same time, the church would be then putting the mans back on the tax rolls. So the church would also be paying tax on that property. So this is the beginning of a, in the past what we've had when this has happened is it's been brought in such a way that people have shied away from it because it's been brought along with military housing and people have not wanted to take away the military housing tax exemption. This time it was brought very cleverly 